Okay, there we go, working. All right, <clears throat> so we're in the home stretch now. For me anyway, not for you guys, you, you're, you're just getting started. Okay, so where I left off was talking about um, L1 regularization. Uh, let's see, and I sort of, I had to skip over the part about why compressed sensing works, but I encourage you to go back and look at at these couple of slides to, you know, if you're curious about that topic. It's not quite in the mainstream of what you're doing in learning, but um, I wrote these for another audience that, that uh, you know, so I had a lot of fun with them. Okay, um, so, I mean, the classical thing that Tib Sharani did in 1996 or 97, whenever it was, was he took a, a linear regression problem and added on this L1 term. In fact, the way he stated it was like this. It was not in this form, it was in this equivalent form. We actually had a constraint on L1, and he tried playing with the delta, and he observed that the bigger you made the delta, the more non-zeros crept into the solution X. And ultimately, when delta was very large, you just got the least square solution. Um, he was mostly interested in the case where A was overdetermined, so A had more uh, rows than columns. Um, but in compressed sensing, it's the other way around. In compressed sensing, you typically have more columns than rows in A. A is underdetermined. So this is one example of what we want to solve when we're using the L1 norm. More generally, we've got a more general objective and there was some discussion about uh, one of the questions just before lunch was, does it really work when you've got a more general F? And the answer is you can't prove things about it in general, but often as a heuristic it works pretty well. And that was actually observed a long time ago. Um, people that were doing inverse problems in uh, geophysical inversion way back when, uh, maybe the 70s or something, tried this trick of adding on the L1 norm and uh, got good results with it uh, in sort of getting less complex solutions. So signal processing neural networks, I think it was all tried in those settings. There's a whole range of uh, different applications here. These were the ones I was talking about in geophysics, 73, radio astronomy. So all these were people that were using the L1 or something very much like it. Okay. Um, so why does it yield sparse solutions and then how, we, how do we go about solving it? So this is the canonical picture for arguing why the L1 norm works, okay? So there are two pictures here. One is where we have an L2 norm instead of an L1 norm. So we're trying to minimize the least squares objective subject to the L2 norm being less than some number delta. So the brown ball here, or the red ball, indicates uh, the constraint set. So we have to find a solution inside this set that comes as close as possible to minimizing this function. And so the solution is going to be this point here because this, you know, if we move into the feasible set in any direction from this point, we're only going to be making the function bigger. This is a very well-conditioned function. It's got circular contours. But in general, it'll be ellipsoidal for this kind of function. All right. So you can see that almost wherever I put the uh, you know, the center of the circle and the contours, and if I make them ellipsoidal, it almost doesn't matter what I do, I'll always end up either on the surface of the ball, or if I'm lucky, the minimizer of the function will be somewhere inside the ball. But in any case, the solution will almost always have both of the components of W non-zero, right? Almost always. Whereas if I use the L1 ball, the contours of the L1 ball are this, these diamonds, okay? So in this case, with the L1 uh, norm, this is the constraint set here. And for the same objective, the minimizing point is actually here, okay? And this is a point where only the W2 component is positive. The W1 component is zero. And you can see that if I move this circle around, if I make it ellipsoidal, probably more often than not, the solution is going to be at one of the four points of the diamond, okay? There will be a lot of cases where it's actually on one of these edges, but, you know, probably half the time or close to half the time will be at one of the points. And if I go to higher dimensions, then the, the, the fraction of the time that it's on one of the points or one of the edges of the diamond is going to be much, much higher than the fraction of the time it's inside one of the open faces. And so what this means is that L1 is giving you a sparse solution in this case, right? Only one of the two components is non-zero. So it's forcing it, one of the components to be zero. Okay, so here is a very, very simple problem, and this is going to be relevant to the algorithms we talk about later, in which I've got a quadratic function and an L1 minimum. Now, because I'm just dealing with a scalar here, W is just a scalar, the L1 uh, norm is just the absolute value, okay? So I can explicitly 
solve this problem, very, very simple problem. I can solve it. I can write down the answer in closed form. And I get three cases. First of all, if the Y thing is between minus tau and tau, then the solution of this thing is zero, okay? Uh, the minimizer is W equals zero. If Y is bigger than tau, um, then the solution is going to become non-zero. It's going to move to Y minus tau. Now, you can, you can prove this by just considering the three cases. You can, first of all, look for a solution where W is positive by just replacing absolute value of W just by W. And you can try minimizing this. And if, in fact, the minimizer is positive, then you've found the right answer, right? You can also look for a solution where the minimizer is negative by replacing absolute value with minus W. And you can minimize that. And if you end up with a negative answer, then that's the answer. Okay, so just by taking it case by case, you can do a little exercise and show that, in fact, this is a closed form solution. Okay, so it's what we call soft thresholding. We can draw a picture of that. Unfortunately, I've got lambda where I shouldn't have tau, but I couldn't change the picture because it was already hardwired into the talk. So just think of the lambda here as tau. So what's happening here is the y axis is the solution of this problem, the x axis is y. So you can see when y is bigger than tau, it's just going up linearly, but it's been shrunk by, by tau. When y is less than minus tau, again, it's, it, it's, it, it's increasing with y, but it's been shrunk again by tau. It's been moved towards zero. And when y is between minus tau and tau, then it's actually zero. Okay? So, now why did we spend so much time on that one example? Well, it turns out high dimensional examples, when this is an L1 norm and this is a least squares, basically reduced to this. You can take it one component at a time and do exactly this operation. It's called soft thresholding. Okay. Now contrast this to what if I, instead of using the L1 norm here, I use a squared L2 norm. Okay. Then um, uh, the solution of this problem, again, I can do it analytically because it's still a quadratic. So I can write down the derivative of this thing and set it to zero. And what I find is that the solution is 1 over 1 plus tau times y. And you can see here that this is almost never sparse, right? That um, provided y has all its components non-zero, w will also have all its components non-zero. They've just all been shrunk towards the origin. Whereas here, there's some chance that y, that you know, even if y is non-zero, that the w will actually be zero, okay? So you see the sparsification happening here, but not here. Okay, so this is where I wade into learning. So I'll say a little bit about uh, classification. And this is all something that I'm sure is completely familiar to you. So I can go through it fairly quickly. So this is the classic problem. This is the first machine learning problem I heard about many moons ago, back in the 90s. Um, and that's just linear classification. So we're given a bunch of feature vectors, x, i. They all live in R, D. We've got binary labels, minus 1 and plus 1. This is our training set. We've got n points in the training set. And what we're looking for is a set of weights w, so that when I apply those weights to the features, and then I have an intercept term as well, um, that the sign of that linear function of the weights accurately predicts the label. That's what I'm hoping for. OK. So this is where you know, it gets into the uh, you know, hardcore philosophy of machine learning. But if I assume that this data is coming from some underlying distribution, P of X and Y, some distribution in feature space and label space, then what I really want to do is to choose these weights so that the expectation over that distribution is generally correct, right? There aren't too many cases where the classification has the wrong sign. That's what I'd really like to do. But of course, I don't know what this underlying distribution is. I only have this empirical measure based on the data points that I'm being given. So I can replace this, es this um, estimate thing with an uh, average over all the data points I've given of this sort of loss, okay? Now the other problem is that, you know, this thing here is a step function, right? It's, it's zero if I get the sign right, it's one if I get the class wrong. And so what I'd like to minimize is the number of points for which I get the class wrong, okay? But this is a very hard thing to optimize over because it's a step function or a sum of step functions, which is really hard. So, of course, in learning, what we do is convexify that. We replace that with some uh, other function, which is more tractable, which gives us a more tractable optimization problem, okay? And so we replace this h function with a loss function where we've got the margin here, this thing we want to be positive, 
uh, I think, or negative, I don't know, one of the two. We certainly wanted to have a certain sign. And so the, the f of w is the sum of all these, the empirical sum, or the, the sum of all these losses, like individual losses. And then we add on a regularizer. So, you know, often in SVM, this is actually a squared two norm. That gives us the hyperplane with maximum uh, margin. But if you want to look for sparse solutions, if you want to find weight vectors that are mostly zero, then you might want to use the L1 norm instead. And I think L1 SVM also has a pretty long history. My colleague Olvi Mangasarian at Wisconsin, who's an optimizer, who's one of the first optimizers that worked with learning problems, uh, he wrote some papers about L1 SVM. It has the advantage, by the way, that if you've got a hinge loss here and an L1 norm here, you can write that as a linear program. So you can just call LP software to solve it. All right. So. And this, notice that this has the structure that I was talking about earlier when I was talking about uh, stochastic gradient, that the f of w is the sum of a bunch of individual losses, each of which just depends on one item of data. So this is like a perfect case for using stochastic gradient. And in fact, that's what Botu and Lacoon and all those people in learning that did stochastic gradient, that's, that's why they did it, because it was such a good match to this problem. All right, so... If you want to replace this with some, you know, this is the original misclassification problem. The hinge loss function is one way to convexify the misclassification function. You sort of majorize it by a convex function, but in some sort of minimal way. So that function has this shape, okay? It's this piecewise linear thing with two lines. So it's convex, but not, um, not smooth, obviously. You can do other things, like you can put a logistic loss, you can put a squared loss, and various other things people have tried. Um, I'm very proud here to notice that I, we did these slides before I heard Zuban's talk this morning where he said that logistic regression is the wrong term and you should be saying logistic classification. So I'm proud that I got something right here, right? <laughs> so, and in fact, I went and changed it. I cheated because I had logistic regression here, but I changed it when, during the break. Okay, so you know there's a whole bunch of loss functions you can use here to approximate the misclassification, and and here they are. There are different regularizers you can use. You can un you, you can have no regularizer. You can have the two norm squared. You can have the one norm. Uh, I guess they're the three main ones. Um, so there's many different structures here, but they all have structures like we've been talking about. Okay, and of course then there's the extension to nonlinear classifiers. So you can bring in a lifting into a high dimensional space and you can do classification in that space and that of course leads directly to kernel learning which people here are experts on here in Tübingen and, and so on. Um, okay, and you can use many sorts of basis functions there and of course you don't have to do the lifting explicitly. You can take the dual and use a kernel instead and do it all implicitly. But you, you guys know all about that. I don't have to tell you about that. All right, so what if you, instead of, one, instead of just looking for sparsity using L1, suppose that there are relationships between the components of X. So very often, the components of X are not completely independent of each other. They're not, uh, there's some sort of natural dependence between them. So an example would be if the components of X are coefficients in a wavelet basis expansion, for instance. So wavelet basis functions are not independent of each other, right? There's sort of a, they sort of form a hierarchy from the coarse ones to the finer ones. And so you would expect the coefficients, therefore, to also form some sort of hierarchy, okay? So if you sort of arrange the coefficients in a tree according to, um, you know, which basis functions they're coefficients of, um, you wouldn't just expect certain random elements of the tree to be turned on. You'd expect to see maybe some subtrees forming, you know, of the important non-zero uh, wavelet bases. And so there's been some attention to sort of building in that structure uh, into the, the regularizer, okay? And this is where some black art comes in because you want to design the regularizer psi so that when you include it in the inference problem, uh, the solution that you get out has the sort of structure that you're looking for. And in the case of trees, uh, you know, getting a tree structure, that's actually non-trivial, all right? So I'm not going to say too much about that, except that one of the tricks is to sort of group the variables in some way, to, to come up with acceptable groups that you then turn on and off, not as individual components, but as a group, okay? So you make some decision during the optimization implicitly, the algorithm decides whether you select a group or you don't select a group, okay? 
So it's like L1 except with, except with groups. Uh, so you allow inside each group, you allow density, uh, but you only sort of want to pick a relatively small number of groups. Okay, and the groups are tied to prior knowledge about sort of acceptable sparsity patterns. And there's actually some work showing that if you make the right assumptions about the groups that you can actually get better quality uh, reconstructions by various criteria. And I've got a couple of examples of problems that are learning type problems where the group structure occurs in a very simple way. So for instance, if you're doing multi-class classification, one thing that people do, so I'm told, is that you actually you want to generate a whole set of feature vectors, one for each class. So if you've got k classes, instead of having a single feature vector that predicts well, you know, the binary class, you actually have k feature vectors, and you try to choose those vectors so that the maximum of all these functions, these linear functions, uh, actually selects the right class, right? So in this case, the, the thing that you're optimizing over are all the weights. It's k times d numbers altogether. But you can see that obviously they're tied together, uh, you know, they're not all completely independent, in the following sense, that if you just take this full set of KD numbers and do, uh, and put an L1 regularizer on it, it'll select some subset of these KD weights to be non-zero. But it's not particularly useful to have an answer like this. You'd prefer to have an answer like this. You'd, have, you'd prefer to have an answer where you sort of home in on certain features that are important in distinguishing between the different classes. So in this solution, all of the k feature vectors, there are k equals four here, so each of the, all of the k feature vectors just depend on two of the features, right? So those two features are enough to tell you which of the four classes um, each, of these, uh, uh, pro each, each of these data points lie in. So you'd like to have an answer like that because what it means is that when you're using these feature vectors to to classify future data points that come along, you only have to find out what those two features are. You don't have to capture all of the features, right? And sometimes that's extremely useful just to be able to home in on a subset of features. Okay, so this is an example of group sparsity because you sort of want to associate, you want to define the groups to be the columns of, these, of this matrix and you want to turn a column on or off as a group, right? You want to select columns rather than selecting individual elements. So this is a case where Group sparsity is, is a reasonable thing to do. Multitask learning, another very similar example where each row represents a task and each column represents shared features. So same idea. Okay. So here's one way to do that. Here's, here's a natural way to define psi to sort of do group regularization. The idea is that you, you form a bunch of subvectors of the full vector x. You sort of, you, you form these subvectors. In this case, there are m of them. And I'm, I'm going to denote x brackets i as the subvector is the ith subvector. So it typically is going to have more than one element of x in it. And you define psi to be just the sum of the two norms of all of those subvectors, right? So this sort of regularizer does a reasonable job of selecting individual subvectors to turn on or off, okay? Um, I actually did some work with uh, these statisticians in about 2000. It, wasn't published till 2005, where we used an infinity norm here instead of a one norm. So we had a sum of, instead of a two norm, so we had a sum of infinity norms. And, um, uh, and you know, the intent was the same, to turn a group on or off as a group. So these sorts of problems with this sort of regularizer, the algorithms that I'm going to describe for L1, in the case where these groups don't overlap, right, where they're independent groups, like in those examples I just gave, a multitask learning, this is easy to deal with because you can just do the projections one group at a time. But there are other interesting cases where the groups overlap in different ways, right? So in the case of, of wavelet coefficients, the groups are overlapping. Each subtree of the, of the coefficient tree, is you can define that to be a group, okay? And so the groups, of course, overlap. Each component is in multiple different groups. Um, and so then the problem of working with this regularizer and defining algorithms that can deal with that regularizer are a little bit harder. And then you get cases where the groups have a much more general structure. They don't decompose into a sort of a tree hierarchical structure. And they're harder again to deal with. Okay. So I'm not going to go into any really much more detail about that just for lack of time. But um, it is an area that people have been working on quite a lot for the last few years.
All right, so let's turn for a, a little bit to matrix inference problems. So a classic problem in this area is matrix completion. So first of all, just thinking back to what we've been doing here, we've been working with vectors mostly up to now where we're making some observations B about a vector X based on some matrix um, big B, okay? And we're trying to find the minimum cardinality uh, X that achieves these, uh, that satisfies these observations. This is the canonical problem with no noise and so on. And we've shown, I think, that, uh, yeah, that that's NP hard. Now, the corresponding thing to do with matrices is that we've got an unknown matrix X. It's now a matrix rather than a vector. And again, we're making some linear observations about it. So each observation of X that we're making is some uh, combination, some linear combination of elements of X, right? And when we take that linear combination of elements of X, we get a component of this vector B. Okay, and we do that, say, p times, so we get p observations. So the natural thing to do is, you know, if, you know, if you're looking for the, the least complicated x that explains these observations, the natural thing to do is look for the lowest rank x that explains these observations, right? So this is kind of the analog of looking for the sparsest vector x, is to find the lowest rank matrix x. Okay, so... Uh, well, there's something missing here. I need a bound on the uh, acceptable error, the acceptable deviation from the uh, observations. But this is one way to state it. Um, yeah, I guess, I, sorry, I just left that off. This should be less than delta or less than or equal to delta. So this is a problem you would like to solve, but of course this is hard. It's NP hard. Um, and so we do the analogous thing when we relax these, the cardinality to the L1 norm the analogous thing in this case, or one way to relax it, is to relax the rank of x to the so-called nuclear norm. And the nuclear norm is defined to be the sum of singular values of x. So in the case where x is a symmetric positive definite matrix, it's just the sum of eigenvalues. But in the general case where x is m by n, you define it to be the sum of singular values. Okay? Um, and there was a paper by Recht and Fasel and Parillo in 2010 where they showed that under certain, ob certain uh, assumptions on the observation vector or the observation tensor B, that uh, this gave the same solution as using the rank. So it's the analogous, the analogy very closely to compressed sensing. Okay. So this is the, the one way to formulate that problem. Instead of a constraint formulation, you can have a, a, a matching uh, function here plus tau times the nuclear norm. Uh, you can actually, um, what, what do I want to say about this? Uh, yeah, the special case of matrix completion. When we talk about matrix completion, we're talking about the observations of X having a very special form, namely that we're just observing individual elements of X. So the Netflix problem is like that. I think you've all heard of the Netflix problem, right? So the Netflix problem is you're given a partial matrix indicating people's movie preferences. And of course... This matrix is very partial because each user has only indicated a small subset of the whole universe of movies that they've actually seen and they actually want to rate. And so you want to fill in that matrix based on this, you know, 1% or whatever it is of, uh, of the observations that are actually made um, available to you. So um, the natural way to fill that in is to some, do some, you know, some sort of low rank completion. And so that implies a very special form of the observation matrix B. Now, unfortunately, the, that sort of observation matrix does not satisfy the assumptions that were made in proving that uh, this relaxed problem with the nuclear norm actually recovers the right answer. Here, you had, they had to assume, in this paper, they had to assume a rip-like property on the observation matrix, or observation tensor B, that's not satisfied by, uh, by the classical matrix completion framework. And I think there's more recent theory where... Um, where they show that that uh, you don't actually need the rip type property, you can get away with something that's a bit weaker, I believe. But I'm not, I haven't really kept up with that literature. But I wanted to mention this because, um, uh, it, well, we can ask the question: Why does a nuclear norm favor low rank solutions? So remember, a couple of slides back, I solved this very simple canonical problem where I had y minus, I had I think x minus y squared plus tau times the absolute value of x and we had the soft threshold operator. Well, if I replace x minus y with the Frobenius norm of y minus x squared, Frobenius norm is like a two norm, it's just the sum of the squares of all the elements of the matrix, right? 
and, uh, and I put the nuclear norm here in place of the absolute value or the one norm, then we can actually solve this problem in closed form, okay? And the way we do it is we take the y, that's the thing that we're given, and we do a singular value decomposition. Does everyone know what SVD is? Okay, SVD is where you express y as a product of an orthogonal matrix U, a diagonal positive or uh, non-negative matrix uh, lambda, and another orthogonal matrix V, okay? So there are efficient algorithms to compute that in order M, N squared operations or something. Uh, so when you, you, so if you have this uh, SVD of Y, you can actually write down in closed form a solution of this problem, and you get it by taking the same U, the same V, and you replace lambda with the soft threshold of the elements of lambda. So you just look at all the elements on the diagonal of lambda, and you do this soft thresholding operation. And by that I mean you decrease each of them by tau. If they drop below zero, you just cut them off at zero. Okay? So that's what I mean. You shrink all of them by tau. Any of them that go negative, you just set to zero. Okay? So if you do that, you know, this is a closed form solution. And so you can, uh, you can uh, implement methods that are based on this operation uh, relatively efficiently. And in fact, there are algorithms for solving this problem that m repeatedly do this operation. And these are two of them here. Quite recent work, as you can see. So here's another problem involving matrices, and I think this one is also maybe familiar to you. Uh, certainly there's a number of optimizers that have beaten on this in recent years. But this is where you're trying to recover sparse inverse covariance matrices. So you've got a random, uh, a Gaussian random variable Y, which is actually a vector with uh, D components, right? And there's some dependencies between the elements of Y. And we're going to assume that they satisfy some Gaussian distribution. I'm also going to assume that I know what mu is. I know what the mean is, just, for, just to make things simpler. But I don't know the uh, covariance matrix. Okay, I don't, know the, I don't know C. All right, so the way that I'm going to estimate C is that I'm going to make, random ob I'm going to make a bunch of observations of Y. Let's call it Y1 through Yn. So I've got N observation vectors. And I'm going to write down the sample covariance matrix, okay, S, defined in the obvious way. Now the problem is that if I just take S and I take the inverse of S, it's not going to be sparse in general. It's generally going to be dense, right? And I might have some prior knowledge that these random variables are not actually, uh, most of them don't, or most pairs of these random variables are actually not correlated. So there are certain dependencies or independencies between most of the pairs of the random variables. There might be some underlying graphical structure that describes which ones are related and how strongly. Okay, So I'm going to try to use an approximate uh, inverse of S that reveals the underlying dependencies. Right? So I'm looking for a matrix uh, S whose inverse is sparse. Um, and uh, okay, I'm looking for an approximation to S with a sparse inverse. That's what, basically what I want to do. Okay? Because uh, that reveals these independencies. I'm sorry if I sort of didn't explain that very well, but I'm sure you all know much better than I do what's going on here. So I don't have to dwell on it. So the trick that we use to do that, and this, this again is kind of seat of the pants, and I'm hoping that you guys in machine learning have a nice rigorous justification for why we use this regularizer. But this is what, we, what we've been doing in, in optimization, is just taking the so-called component-wise one norm of P. So P is going to be the approximate... Uh, sparse inverse of S, right? So if I leave off this term, if I set tau to be zero and minimize this function, I just get S inverse as the solution. You can show by, you know, taking the derivative of this with respect to P and the derivative of this with respect to P, you just get S. The derivative of this with respect to P is P inverse and so you end up with P inverse equals S and you just get the sparse um, uh, sorry, you just get the inverse of the sample covariance. But by adding on this term, you're sort of forcing P to be sparse, to be element-wise sparse. And so by messing around with tau, you can make it more or less sparse. Okay? Tau sort of controls the sparsity. So this is the objective that we work with to get a sparse approximation to inverse covariance. Okay? And I'll come back to this. I'll talk about algorithms for this problem a little bit later on. All right, so this whole idea of using the one norm, recently it's been put into a more general framework. So there's a 2010 paper uh, by uh, Recht and Wilski and Perillo and uh, um, 
Venkat Chandra Sakaran, uh, who's now at Caltech, but they have this concept of the atomic norm, okay? And so they notice a commonality between all these different problems, you know, wavelet basis expansion, uh, sparse signals, uh, 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 you know, uh, low rank matrices and so on. They put, they're trying to put them all into a common framework. And they're saying that the common uh, thing is that the solution that you're looking for is a linear combination of a small number of atoms. So they've got this set A, which is a set of atoms, right? Fundamental, simple objects. And they're looking to express the solution X as a linear combination of a few elements of this set, a positive linear combination of a few elements of this set. And so they define this thing called the atomic norm. And the atomic norm is you take X and you express it as economically as possible in terms of elements from the atomic set. So you're looking for the expansion of this form such that the sum of the coefficients is as small as possible. And that gives you the atomic norm. So it's sort of an implicit definition. But for certain special cases, of course, you can turn this into an explicit definition like the one norm or the nuclear norm. Okay. So here are some examples to make this a little bit clearer. If I define, if I'm dealing with vectors x in R2, two-dimensional vectors, and if I define the atomic set to be these four vectors, <coughs> these are just the unit vectors and their negatives, okay, then the atomic norm just reduces to the one norm. You can show by you know, plugging into this definition, working with it a little bit, you can show that the one norm is just the same as the atomic norm. So it reduces to a familiar object in that case. If you're dealing with uh, low rank matrices, you can prove similarly that the one norm is the nuclear norm. Okay, You can prove that. Um, if you're dealing with uh, the binary vectors, if you define the atomic set in Rn, to be all the vectors whose coefficients are plus one and minus one, and you look at all possible combinations, you get a basis with two to the n vectors in it, because there are two choices for every position of the vector, then the atomic norm reduces to the infinity norm, right? And there are also, there are other interesting examples. There are examples like uh, rotation matrices, uh, then the atoms are all possible orthogonal matrices, things like that. So, so it generalizes very nicely and encompasses a lot of uh, problems that we've already talked about that are fairly familiar in sparse optimization. So the question then becomes is suppose you want to, in, a, in this very general setting, suppose you want to solve this sort of uh, Ivanov formulation, the formulation where you're trying to minimize some fitting observation, loss function, uh, subject to some constraint on the L1 norm. So in this ven very general setting, can you come up with some algorithms that, that work? And the answer is yes, and I'll say a little bit more about this later on. It turns out that in that setting, the conditional gradient algorithm, which is a very old algorithm in optimization, it was called Frank Wolf. It was developed I don't know, way back in the 60s, I think. Um, turns out to be a, a useful thing that works in this general setting. And I'll tell you what that is a little bit later on. Okay, so what have we talked about so far in this in this uh, section on regularized optimization? Basically, we've covered a lot of formulations. We haven't said very much about how to solve these problems. But we've talked about, you know, we said a little bit about where these problems come from, image processing, learning. Uh, we've talked about the role of the uh, regularizer. Uh, we've talked about how you have to match the regularizer to the sort of sparsity the structure that you're looking for. Uh, and we've talked about using atomic norms to sort of generalize the whole, uh, the whole idea. And now we're going to say something about algorithms for solving these problems. Okay, so a couple of slides, first of all, on uh, some additional uh, terminology that we're going to need. And this is something we've already talked about a lot, actually, this idea of a subgrade. In fact, I've got a picture on the board here that looks uncannily like the one I drew here. It's quite stunning, isn't it? And I think I've got one extra plane here, but that's the only difference. So this is obviously imprinted on my brain. But anyway, the, the idea of the subdifferential is just you take all the possible hyperplanes that support the function, and the slopes of all of those hyperplanes give you the set called the subdifferential. It's a set of all possible subgradients. Here's an example of computing subdifferentials. Um, this actually might be useful because here we just have a scalar function, and I want to uh, I want you to notice in particular that the subdifferential is actually a point to set mapping, right? So this is the explicitly, this is the subdifferential of this function. So you can notice that for some values of x, the subdifferential is just a single point. Okay, so these are values where the function is smooth. Uh, 
the subdifferential just reduces to being the derivative. But then there are certain points where the subdifferential is actually interval, okay? So it's actually a set. So in this case, we've got a function that, first of all, is a linear piece here that goes from minus infinity to minus 1. And on, along that piece, the function has a slope minus 2. Okay, and then there's a kink. Then it switches from having slope minus 2 to having slope minus 1. And so right at that point, x equals minus 1, any value in the range from minus 2 to minus 1 is an element of the subdifferential. So you actually get an interval here. Then in the interval between minus 1 and 0, the slope is minus 1, so then we're here. When you're at 0, anything between minus 1 and 0 is uh, an acceptable subdifferential. So you get an interval there. And then as x is, when x is greater than 0, the function just becomes 1 half x squared. And so you can differentiate that, and you just get a single point x. Okay, so, so this is a graph of the subdifferential. You notice that uh, for these two points, these two kinky points, the subdifferential is actually a piece of the vertical direction, right? So this is a graph of this. All right. That might help to see that because, uh, uh, you know, you might have to actually take subderivatives at some point. All right. So this, is, this looks a lot like that uh, little uh, problem I put up earlier where I had the scalar x and the scalar y and the absolute value here. This is a generalization of that because this object called the Moreau's proximity operator I like to call it a shrink. Um, this object of plugging in a y into this little subproblem and getting out an x, namely the minimizer of this, is a fundamental uh, operation that you have to do in a lot of different algorithms for solving these regularized optimization problems. And so we give it a name. We call it Moreau's proximity operator. Apparently, it's due to this guy Moreau who is still alive. Someone tracked him down recently. He's in a nursing home somewhere in France. He doesn't do research anymore, but, um, but he's very pleased to know that people are still talking about him 50 years later. Um, I think he's just turned 90-something, so he's, he's getting on a bit. But um, So we give it a name, prox subscript uh, psi here. And so this is an operation that maps y to x. Okay. So this is well-defined. Provided psi is convex, this guy is coercive. It's actually strictly convex. So this thing has a unique solution. Okay, So it is a point-to-point -point mapping. All right, And in the special case that we talked about earlier where this is the absolute value function and y is a scalar, we actually recover that soft threshold operator that we talked about earlier. Now if you have blocks, you know, we talked about block operations. If you have blocks where the blocks are separated, where you actually partition the components of x, into a bunch of blocks, m blocks, then you can apply this operation block by block. Okay, You don't have to plug in the full vector y and get a full vector x out. You can just plug in a block of y variables and get a block of x's out. Okay, So you can apply this operation a piece at a time. Um, and uh, so, it, you know, it, again, it becomes very economical. All right, so soft thresholding is a proximity operator for the L1 norm. Another thing to note here is that if the, uh, if the psi function that you're dealing with is actually the indicator function of a convex set, this is a way to, to express constraint optimization problems as regularized optimization problems. If I've got a constraint optimization problem, minimize f subject to x belonging to omega, that's the equivalent of minimizing f of x plus the indicator function over the set omega of x. Exactly equivalent problem. And so we can actually treat constraint optimization problems as regularized optimization problems where the regularization function is the indicator function. And interestingly, if you apply this prox operator to the indicator function, you recover the projection operator. You recover this operation of, of mapping um, an arbitrary element uh, x to the nearest point in x to the set omega. So if, there's this, if this is the set omega and this is the point x, then the Euclidean projection is the nearest point in omega to x. So it's the point where you sort of drop an orthogonal to the boundary of, uh, of omega. And so, so, yes? So the indicator function uh, is that that value zero, 1? Zero, 0, infinity. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, you get something different if it was 0, 1. Okay, um, uh, if you have the squared Euclidean, we ha again had a, a 
a version of this earlier on where we were dealing with scalars, but if we're now dealing with a vector y and we have a two norm squared here, then there's a, the proximity operator is well defined for that value of psi as well. And again, it's just a scaling of the vector y. Uh, if you've got a two norm, not a squared two norm here, if you've actually got a two norm, again, you can define the proximity operator for that. Okay, for the two norm. And what it is is that it, if the norm of x is greater than tau, then you essentially project back onto the circle. Okay? So you project back onto the circle and you shrink. If the norm of x is less than tau, then, uh, uh, then the proximity operator just maps onto the origin. Okay? So the point I'm trying to make here is that there are, for a bunch of different values of psi, you can actually compute these proximity operators in a neat uh, fairly intuitive way. In fact, this is an exhaustive list that Mario drew up of a bunch of different size and their corresponding proximity operators. So someone has actually gone to the trouble of tabulating, what, 17 of these things. Okay, and there are some recognizable ones up here, indicator functions and so on, Q norms, and they've all got closed form solutions for the, uh, the, the uh, Moreau proximity operator. For the case of matrix, they're all for vectors. Now, if we go back to talking about matrices, again, we've already looked at this case. The proximity operator for the tower times the nuclear norm is given by exactly the operation we came up with earlier. We do the SVD, we look at the components on the diagonal of lambda, and we soft threshold them. And then we reconstruct the, the matrix, and that gives us the outcome of the proximity operator. So we already talked about that one earlier on. Okay, so... That's just one fundamental operation. How do we actually use that to come up with an algorithm for solving problems where you're, you're doing minimization of f plus tau times psi? Well, here is the basic algorithm. This is kind of the natural, in some sense, the natural extension of steepest descent. So all you do is you take, you get from one x to the next, xk to xk plus one, by taking a steepest descent step involving the gradient of f, okay? You do that first. And then you apply the shrink operator or the proximity operator for alpha k times psi. Okay? That's all you do. So it's sometimes called forward backward. I think this is what they call the forward step where you're taking a step in x. And then this is the backward step where you're taking the psi into account. So you're basically, you know, taking care of x, taking care of psi separately, alternating back and forth between the two. It's actually been reinvented a bunch of different times in different communities. Um, sometimes called proximal gradient, uh, sometimes called iter iterative shrinking and thresholding. So I think, I'm not actually sure what's the shrinking step and what's the thresholding step. Because this operator, you know, it's kind of a shrink and it's kind of a threshold. So I don't know exactly which is which here. But anyway, it's been called all of these names, okay? And some others too. And it's been re reinvented in several different communities. And as I say, it's a natural extension of, of uh, steepest descent, so it's an unsurprising kind of method. So it's been analyzed. There's this paper that was published in 2006, but uh, it was sort of rediscovered you know, a few years later where they analyzed exactly this method in more or less exactly this setting, but they came up with a convergence analysis for a sort of an inexact version. So they allowed you to actually step in the negative gradient direction, but maybe make some little error BK. And then before you'd applied the prox operator, made you, maybe you made another little error then. Or maybe, I think after you applied the prox operator, maybe you made another little error then. And then maybe instead of moving just from xk to that point, maybe you just took a step in the direction of that point. Okay. So they just sort of generalized that basic algorithm up here in a couple of different ways. And what they proved in this paper was that provided these errors eventually go to zero, the ak's and the bk's, and provided the lambda k's are sort of bounded away from zero, that eventually you're always taking a significant step towards this point, provided all those conditions are satisfied, and provided the step lengths alpha k are bounded by 2 over L, uh, then they can prove that you get convergence. Now this condition here, you might remember if you go right back to my first lecture yesterday, when I talked about short step steepest descent, I talked about exactly this step length, right? This is the first algorithm we, that we talked about. And we proved that this was, uh, this had, um, in the case of a strongly convex function, this gave us linear convergence. In the case of a weakly convex function, we got 1 over k convergence from this. 
So th exactly the same condition applies here, okay? So in that sense too, it's a generalization of uh, you know, short step steepest descent. So if you apply this condition to this particular function, if you make this particular choice of psi and you make this particular choice of f, um, you know, this again is the, the lasso type formulation, also crops up in compressed sensing. Then the gradient of f is just this vector here. Uh, the prox operator just becomes a soft thresholding operator and you're in business. Okay, and you get this algorithm. Now, we, I want to make one point about this, and this is something that uh, I know a number of you are interested in, but it's not something, unfortunately, I have time to dwell on, and that is that if you apply this algorithm, what you find is that after a certain number of iterations, a bunch of the components of X become zero. And in fact, you can prove, these authors proved in 2008, that if you make this conservative choice of step length and you iterate long enough, that eventually the iterates have the correct zero set. So that the set of iterates, I call it Z, at which XK is equal to zero, is the same set at which the solution has zero components, okay? So you get the sort of finite identification property. After a finite number of iterations of this method, the zero set is identified correctly. Now this is nice because that means that eventually, after you've taken sufficiently many iterations, this whole algorithm essentially is just doing unconstrained minimization of a quadratic on the, on the non-zero subspace, okay? So once it's figured out which components are zero, all it's left to do is to solve a, a non-linear quadratic over a much smaller manifold. You're no longer working in Rn, you're working on, uh, in R of the cardinality of this set N, which is typically a much smaller set. And if this is coming from compressed sensing, the corresponding submatrix, the quadratic, you know, the corresponding piece of the quadratic part of the objective is actually a very well-conditioned matrix. If those properties that I just mentioned very briefly earlier hold for this matrix like restricted isometry, this thing is actually close to the identity. And so you actually get, asymptotically, you get quite fast linear convergence, much faster than the general theory would suggest, okay? And so I just wanted to make that observation that the general theory that we talked about right at the start you don't just get that behavior, you get something even better asymptotically. Once you've identified the correct non-zero set, you get quite rapid linear convergence. Now, remember I said yesterday that the basic gradient method is kind of a, a bad method, the short step gradient method. Oh, sorry, I have to go back so many slides. The short step gradient method is not a good method to use, and I said that if instead you use like uh, an accelerated gradient method or FISTA or something like that, uh, and plug it into the same framework now, now that you've got a psi to deal with as well, you can just take the same FISTA direction and, and do a prox operator on it. Uh, y there's no excuse for not doing that, okay? And so that's what we do now. We can take, uh, uh, you know, we can basically do FISTA uh, and sort of blend in the prox operator into the FISTA algorithm. So to implement that, all we do is to take the original FISTA approach and just replace the first step here with a prox, okay? So the only difference between this and the version of FISTA I told you about 24 hours ago is that the prox has suddenly appeared, okay? Apart from that, it's the same algorithm. And so you get, um, you know, you get these nice convergence properties. You can show that the, the function values of f approach x star like at a one over k squared rate. And that's actually improvement on what you get by just taking the gradient here and not doing this enhancement. If you just do this step and don't do this part of the step, you only get an order one over k rate. So FISTA already, the theory is better. But in fact, as I mentioned on the previous slide, it gets even better than that when you apply this to a compressed sensing problem because the rate speeds up to being linear once you've got the non-zero set correct. Okay. So here's an observation, though, that, that I already made yesterday. The step size, if you just restrict the step size to being less than 2 over L, where L is the maximum eigenvalue of the Hessian, that's usually a very timid short step, okay? And so remember yesterday I talked about Barzillai Boyne, which was a way that you chose much bigger steps, sometimes steps that even increased F. You can do the same thing here. You needn't restrict yourself to having a small alpha K. You can try bigger values of alpha K and then, you know, maybe... Um, if you want to do Barzillai Boyne, you, you, you may not even want to check whether it decreases F or not. Alternatively, you can, uh, 
you can do backtracking where you keep decreasing. Uh, I should have said decreasing here. You keep decreasing alpha k until uh, you get a decrease in the function. Okay, But the point is here that you want to be a little bit more adventurous with the alpha k. And in fact, we wrote this paper on Sparser that actually wrote it in 2007. And when we were writing this, we didn't know about all this prior work that had been done in this space. Okay, So I have a convergence theory that was kind of, you know, sort of independent of, of, uh, of all these other algorithms, but we found out that it fitted squarely into the framework of all these other uh, algorithms that had been developed some years earlier. Here's another thing you can do. So sometimes when you're doing regularization, you don't really know what value to choose for this parameter tau. And often um, you're actually interested in solving for a whole bunch of values of tau and getting different levels of structure and sparsity and then using some external criterion like dare I say it, you know, BIC or some sort of cross-validation or something to actually pick the value of tau that you think is most appropriate according to some external, um, you know, uh, criterion that's motivated by statistics. So this, this optimization problem that I've been describing might actually be one of an ensemble of optimization problems that you want to solve, okay? So the sensible way to do that is you don't solve each of them in isolation but you can sort of go from the solution of one value of tau to another by doing warm starting. So it's a very natural idea. And first we can note that if tau is, is, is very large, where you're really imposing a lot of structure, you've got a lot of sparsity, very few non-zero elements, those problems are typically a lot easier to solve. So the natural thing to do is to solve for a large value of tau, get a solution for that, decrease tau a little bit, use the previous solution as a starting point, and then keep iterating with the new value of tau. Okay? So it's a very natural sort of warm starting strategy that, again, many people had this idea at, at kind of the same time. So you start with a big value, you start with some arbitrary starting point, you approximately solve this problem for this value of tau. If you've reached your target value of tau, the smallest you want to get, you stop. Otherwise, you decrease tau by some factor sigma. Uh, you redefine the warm start to be the latest solution that you just found, and then you keep iterating. Okay, so this is a natural thing to do. And if you do this, you can you can get much better results than just using a cold start at every value of tau. You get a really substantial speed up in practice. And there's been some recent analysis by these authors that kind of talk about the complexity, the overall complexity of this approach. Okay, and here's a final thing that is sort of a practical thing to do and again uh, I think has makes sense in terms of the statistics and that is you recognize if you're trying to do variable selection here, the original lasso idea. So in lasso I think their motivation was they were trying to identify the important components of X. So they weren't just taking the solution of this problem or maybe the constrained problem and reporting that as their approximate solution. Instead what they'd, they'd take the solution and they'd use that to give them knowledge of what the important components of X are. And then they would solve another problem over just those components, right? Just the non-zero components that have been selected in this step. They'd solve an unconstrained least squares problem over this subvector, right? The, the subvector of non-zeros. So they'd fix the zero components at zero and just solve, you know, uh, an unconstrained problem over the support of the vector that was identified in that step. So it's called debiasing because this term, the presence of this term, introduces a bias even into the non-zero components. It sort of artificially suppresses the magnitude of those components. And so we remove that bias by tossing away that term and solving this problem on a reduced subspace. So this makes sense in compressed sensing, right? People do this in compressed sensing. And um, it certainly has a noticeable effect at improving the accuracy of the solution. Okay, and I think I have one more slide on identifying optimal manifolds, and I know this is a topic of interest to people. By manifolds uh, here, I'm talking about a very special, simple, special case. If you're talking about the, the one-norm regularizer, the, op by the optimal manifold here is simply the non-zero set. It's the set of, of elements of, of X at which the optimal solution is either strictly positive or strictly negative. So this defines a subspace of Rn. And in interesting cases, it's a low-dimensional subspace, right? And I've, I've just discussed that these first-order methods have some sort of a guarantee of finding that optimal manifold after a finite number of iterations. 
So the point I want to make here is that knowledge can be interesting, right? If you know that the algorithm is eventually finding the optimal manifold, you can introduce some heuristic or some acceleration or some extra phase into the algorithm where you just search on that manifold, right? So you might have a heuristic that says, if you're doing one of these first order methods with the one norm regularizer, and the, you notice that the set of non-zeros hasn't changed for the last five iterations, you may then decide, well, maybe it's found the optimal manifold, so maybe I can just forget about the zero components and solve, you know, use some other maybe higher order method to just iterate just on that manifold, okay? And in this case, that's very easy to do, right? In practice, focusing on this low dimensional manifold is very easy. If you're dealing with a more complicated regularizer, with a more complicated description of the manifold, it becomes a little bit more complicated to apply that idea. But the idea is, you know, basically the same. I have a, uh, a recent, I say a recent paper with Lewis because we wrote it in 2008 and we got referee reports in March of 2009, which were pretty good, but we neither of us uh, got, quite got around to revising it until two months ago. So we were trying to set the record for a time between submission and, and resubmission. So it was like four and a half years. Uh, anyway, so we finally got around to doing it. But in that paper we talk about so-called partly smooth functions, which are functions where you can sort of identify the um, uh, manifolds along which psi is actually smooth. So at any given point x, there is a certain manifold passing through x along which psi actually is smooth. And if you can explicitly characterize that manifold, you can in principle shrink the algorithm down onto searching just on that manifold. And you can introduce a second phase where you can uh, you know, get a faster uh, asymptotic rate. Okay, so I mentioned earlier in the context of atomic norm regularization that this uh, idea called, uh, uh, called a conditional gradient might be useful. So do I start at two? Oh wow, okay, time has flown. All right, I had no idea I'm having so much fun here. All right, so I'm going to describe, atom before I get back to talking about atomic norm minimization, I'm just going to talk about minimizing over a general convex closed bounded set. So I'm trying to minimize a function f over the set. So the Frank Wolf idea, it was actually in the 50s that they came, uh, came up with this idea, was that the, is they just take a first order Taylor series expansion of f around the current point xk, okay? And they minimize that first order series over the original set omega. So if, if this set is closed and bounded and convex, you can solve this problem. It's going to obviously have a bounded solution because it's got to be inside this set. And then the idea is that you take a short step in the direction of that point that you've just identified, right? So that's their algorithm. Solve this linear problem, take a short step towards the solution. And in fact, they take a decreasing sequence of step lengths. They showed that if you take steps 2 over k plus 2, that this actually will converge at a 1 over k rate under very weak assumptions, okay? So this was their algorithm. Extremely simple, pretty slow convergence, not even linear convergence, but, um, you know, in some cases very easy to implement. I think they originally applied in the context of quadratic programming, right, where they, the gradient was just the gradient of a quadratic, so it was very simple to compute with just a matrix vector multiply. The original set was just a polyhedron, and so they could solve this subproblem as a LP linear program, and they could, you know, do it in that way. And there are some situations where that's, uh, you can do that very efficiently. Okay, so in the special case where the constraint set is an atomic norm constraint set, um, it turns out that solving that Frank Wolf subproblem simply becomes an atom selection problem. So what you would do if you were to apply Frank Wolf to this is that you would take the latest gradient of f at the current point. And you'd look for the atom, which makes the minimum gr uh, inner product with that latest gradient. So sometimes, for some atoms, you can solve this problem very efficiently, right? And it gives you a new atom that essentially you're adding to the basis. And so each iteration of this conditional gradient frank wolf method, it's essentially building up the basis in a greedy way, right? It's picking a new atom that sort of best explains the part of f that you haven't yet minimized with respect to. So it's got this very nice interpretation when you apply conditional gradient Frank-Wolf to this kind of atomic norm set. So we've done some recent work on this. 
the theory is incredibly simple, right? It, it really is like a, you know, a half a page of a two-column paper or something um, that you can basically use the, the, the original Frank Wolf framework to show uh, that this works. Also, I, I said that this, the greedy selection problem is, is quite simple in a lot of cases. So, for example, sorry, this slide is so cluttered, but in the case of the one norm, as I told you earlier, the atoms of the one norm are just the unit vectors. And so the, the greedy atom that you select is simply you look for the biggest component of grad F, right? Yep, so you want to you find the index for which the absolute value of grad F achieves its maximum. And you add that unit vector to the basis. So that sort of makes sense, right? Uh, in the case where you've got an infinity norm constraint set, you basically choose the new atom to have the same sign as all the components of, or the opposite sign to all the components of X. So there are sensible, simple ways to solve that problem. Okay. Oh, gee, that's all I'm going to say about that. I, I should have mentioned, I cut out some slides here, but I should have mentioned in the case of matrix completion, the atoms there are the set of all possible rank one matrices, right? So the atomic set is actually infinite, infinite cardinality. So if you apply Frank Wolf to nuclear norm minimization, the atom that you generate at each step, you can get it by taking the first singular value, essentially, by taking the gradient of the mismatch function doing the first component of the singular value decomposition, first column of U, first column of V. That gives you the rank one vector that you should, uh, the, the rank one matrix that you should add to the basis. Okay? So I just thought I'd mention that because there's a uh, few people, uh, I have a paper on that, Martin Yagi has a paper on that, uh, Zaid Achawi and people at INRIA are working on this, uh, all in this framework, and it's a very nice general framework. And this is a nice general algorithm for that framework. Okay, I've actually got two more sections in the talk and about 23 minutes to give them in. Uh, fortunately, they're both pretty short sections, so I try to cover most of it. Um, but I wanted to talk about them because I know there are people interested in this. So ADMM, who's heard of ADMM? Okay, fair number of people. This is being used a lot in compressed sensing, image reconstruction and so on. I think it's also being used in some learning applications, so I thought I'd just outline for you the very basic idea of that approach. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about was coordinate descent. And that is mostly bragging about something that we've done recently, so if I don't tell you about that, it's no great loss, right? You can just look at the slides. But I do want to cover this, and I've got maybe 10 slides on augmented Lagrangian. So I'm going to develop the idea of augmented Lagrangian it looks a little bit like magic when you first see it, but it actually has a, a nice intuitive motivation that I like to present. Let's consider this problem, minimizing a, say, a continuous convex function over a set of linear constraints, okay? So again, X is a vector in Rn. So the augmented Lagrangian is defined like this. This is the so-called Lagrangian function, and this is a really important object in deriving optimality conditions for this problem and being, being able to recognize whether or not X star is a solution of this problem. Knowing the Lagrangian or using the Lagrangian is a instru very instrumental object in, in being able to tell whether you're at an optimum. So the Lagrangian, you can think of it as a combination of the objective and a linear combination of the constraints. So you introduce this a vector of Lagrange multiplies lambda. You've got one component of lambda corresponding to each component of AX minus B. So there's one Lagrange multiply for every constraint. So this is just a linear combination of constraints. When you have the augmented Lagrangian, you add on a penalty term. So you take the norm of the infeasibility, AX minus B. You want that to be zero at the solution. So you add on a penalty term, rho k over 2, rho is some positive number, and you penalize the violation of the constraints, right? So that's the augmented Lagrangian. At the moment, it kind of looks like magic but I'll explain it in the next few slides. So this is the basic augmented Lagrangian method. You do a sort of a you know, coordinate, block coordinate descent on this function. First of all, you fix lambda at some value, you fix rho at some value, and you just minimize this function with respect to x. So it's like minimizing the original f plus some linear term, plus some quadratic term. And notice the constraints are gone. You just do an unconstrained minimization of l. You forget about the constraints. You're sort of penalizing them instead of enforcing them. So that's how you get the new x. Having got the new x, you then plug it into this formula to get the new value of lambda. This should be rho k here. I'm sorry, it should be rho k. So you just do this simple linear update 
uh, to get a new value of lambda. And then maybe you leave lamp, uh, rho k the same, maybe you increase it, okay? Uh, but, you know, it's not really critical. So this idea was, again, discovered independently by two authors in the same year. Hestonese is the same guy that did steepest uh, did a conjugate gradient in the 50s, an important linear algebra algorithm. Uh, he, he discovered this, and then Mike Powell, who's a very famous and still very active person in optimization, uh, also discovered it then when he was still in his 20s, I think. Um, okay, but here's my derivation. As I've just stated it, you know, it's sort of like magic. But you can, you can actually motivate it in a kind of a sensible way. First of all, you can take the original problem here and restate it as a min-max problem, right? So I can replace the objective f of x by this problem of maximizing this quantity over lambda. So forget about the min for a moment, just assume x is fixed, and consider what happens when I try to maximize this function over lambda. Now, I've sort of given away the answer here. I should have, I should have made this a little test in-class test problem. But basically what happens here is that if ax minus b is non-zero, okay, if this is non-zero, if there's some non-zero component at ax minus b, I, I'm going to be able to choose lambda to make this function infinite, right? I can just pick the non-zero component. I can take lambda to have the same sign as that component has, and I can just drive that component of lambda off to infinity, okay? And I'll just get an infinite value. So in other words, the only way that this function has a finite value is that if ax equals b, okay? And so I can restate the original problem as a min-max. I can say, fix x, take the max of this with respect to lambda. It's only going to be uh, finite on the set where ax equals b. And on that set, the value of this max function will just be equal f. It will just equal f, right? The contribution from this term will go away. So I can restate this as a min-max problem. Now this is not a very useful reformulation because this max function is a very hard thing to work with. If you've got a function that's sometimes finite equal to f of x, sometimes infinite with this big jump in between, it's pretty hard to minimize that over x, right? Not very tractable. But what you can do is regularize it. So I can take the max function and I can add on this regularization term. So I can, I can take some prior estimate of lambda, there's that word prior, better be careful about how I use that, but I can take some prior estimate and I can replace this function with this function minus a, a convex quadratic, okay, which penalizes how far I'm moving away from the prior, okay. Now by the simple device of adding on this convex quadratic or subtracting this convex quadratic, I've now made this function as a function of lambda. This is a concave function of lambda. And in fact, I can minimize this or maximize this explicitly. This is just concave, it's quadratic. So I can actually write down the closed form solution for lambda. Okay? And provided that I don't move too far from lambda tilde, this is not going to be too bad of an approximation to this function. Okay? In fact, this is the closed form solution of, the, of lambda. Okay? So if I take the closed form solution of lambda, I plug that back into this function, I'm then able to approximate the min-max formulation with the min over x of with the min over x of this. Okay? This is what I get by plugging that into the max. I'm able to get rid of the max by explicitly solving to find the maximum lambda. And this is exactly the augmented Lagrangian. Okay? So in other words, you can motivate this weird augmented Lagrangian problem as a regularization of the min-max formulation of the original problem. Okay? So that's a very simple, fairly intuitive derivation. And in fact, this update formula for lambda, that's exactly the same update formula here, as I had a few slides ago, where this is the prior and this is the new updated version. Okay? So this whole process of regularizing the min-max problem actually gives you the entire augmented Lagrangian problem. And then, as I said, you can change rho. That corresponds to changing the amount of regularization, deviation from the prior, and so on. Once you add subscripts, you just get back the augmented Lagrangian. You can actually repeat this derivation for the case where you've got inequality constraints. You can go through exactly the same derivation. You can write it down as a min-max, but now when you've got inequalities, you want the lambdas to be non-negative, right? So you can just restrict the max problem to have non-negative lambdas. You can do the same thing of adding on the, or 
subtracting off the 1 over lambda minus lambda bar squared. You can work through the same derivation. You can again explicitly ex uh, solve for the optimal lambda of the regularized max problem. You can plug that back in to this uh, formulation or the regularized formulation and you can get a version of the augmented Lagrangian that works for inequality constraints. Now when you do that, you actually get a really weird function because of this kind of uh, max form of the optimal lambda uh, the thing that you have to minimize over to get x is, is actually kind of weird. But it all follows directly, you know, just bear in mind that it's a very simple, the derivation is still very simple. When, you, when you've got inequality constraints, again, uh, it's easy. I wanted to make one more point here, and that is sometimes you've got a situation where you've got some constraints that you want to kind of do augmented Lagrangian to, but you might also have some additional constraints on x that are kind of simple, like there might be bounds or something, where you'd prefer to just to deal with them explicitly. So you can do that. You can put some of the constraints into the augmented Lagrangian, and you can just apply the others explicitly when you come to solve the augmented Lagrangian subproblem. Okay, and that's that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And this actually gives. Oh, well, I don't think I'll tell you about that. All right. Okay, so quick history. I've already told you that it was the first papers on this were 1969. It's actually had a checkered history since then. It's gone in and out of favor in the optimization community. So a lot of work done in the 70s. Uh, two notable names there are Rockefeller and Bert Sakis. Both had papers on this in the 70s. Bert, Bert Sakis did a lot of work on this in the 80s. These are two people that are still very active, of course. Um, there was actually a code in 1992, Con Gould and Twant wrote this code called Lancelot 20 years ago that did this for nonlinear programming. It was a full-blown general NLP package. It won a prize. It was very popular. They put a lot of work into figuring out all the nuts and bolts of making this work. And it was popular for a few years and then it was sort of fell out of favor. Nonlinear interior point came along. SQP methods got pretty good and uh, augmented Lagrangian sort of became uncompetitive. So it sort of languished for about 15 years. It fell out of favor. Now recently it's been revived because in this ADMM variant, which I'm going to tell you about, it's turned out to be a very powerful tool for solving a lot of problems in sparse optimization, you know, compressed sensing, structured optimization, I think some learning problems as well. Now ADMM builds on augmented Lagrangian, but it does it in sort of a very structured way. So here's the basic idea. So let's think of, again, this, is, this problem has the same form as what I described a, uh, a few slides ago, except that instead of a single variable x, I've sort of broken the variable into two pieces, x and z. And I'm trying to minimize an objective where the x and z are separated, right? So the objective is some function of x plus another function of z. But there's coupling between x and z in the constraints. So I've got a linear constraint that involves both x and z. So this is just, you know, constrained optimization. I can do augmented Lagrangian on it. This is how the augmented Lagrangian would be defined. Lambda transpose the constraints, constraint penalty here, exactly what I had a few slides ago. So the standard, if I were then to apply augmented Lagrangian uh, naively and rigorously to this problem, what I would do would be to fix lambda, fix rho, minimize this over x and z, get a new xz, then plug up, plug those, that x and z into the update formula for lambda, get a new lambda, and repeat, okay? But the whole point of doing it this way, of sort of splitting the uh, variables into two components, is that minimizing over x and z jointly might be hard, right? But minimizing over them separately might be easy, right? So, so ADMM essentially does that. It doesn't try to minimize jointly over x and z. It fixes z and lambda and rho, and minimize with respect to x. Then it fixes x with a new x, and rho and lambda, and minimizes with respect to z. And so this, in, you know, you can sort of think of this as an approximate joint sort of block coordinate sort of minimization of over x and z. So you can think of it as an approximate uh, implementation of augmented Lagrangian. Now some would argue, uh, Eckstein argues in a recent paper that that's not the right way to think about it. But, you know, it's, it's, it's one way to think about it as an approximate implementation of augmented Lagrangian. So the point of doing it this way is that for a lot of different structures, a particular, a particular F, particular H, these problems might be much easier to solve than the joint minimization problem. 
So it may be possible to do this very easily. Now, interestingly, ADMM uh, goes back a long way. You can sort of state it in a way that it's got relatives that date right back to the 50s. Operator splitting methods in PDEs, I think you're going to hold up the 10 minute sign any moment now. Okay. Um, uh, operator splitting methods are actually related to ADMM. So that actually predates augmented Lagrangian. So they have roots that go back beyond augmented Lagrangian. There's a recent review paper by Boyd and Eckstein and Parikh and uh, someone else whose name I'm forgetting, uh, 2011, thank you, uh, which, um, which sort of summarizes it. It's a very long paper, but it's not as long as it seems because uh, it's like triple spaced or something. So it's an easy read. Um, and it sort of uh, surveys the history and basically covers some of the same ground I've covered here and gives a lot of examples. Let me give a couple of examples. First of all, unfortunately, I didn't have time to rejig the notation here, but I've restated it in a sort of slightly different notation. Uh, I've made a more special form of the constraints. The objective is the same, but instead of AX plus BZ equals C, I've expressed the constraints as AX equals Z, okay? Now, the reason I've done it that way is that very often the way that people formulate these problems is that you start off with a problem that's actually just minimizing over x, but x appears in two different functions here, and it's an unconstrained problem. So you often start off with a problem like this, but you artificially express it like this, right? You introduce a new variable z, which equals ax, and you just replace ax in the argument of h with z. And you, so you restate this unconstrained problem as this constrained problem. And the whole reason you do that is you want to do ADMM on this form. Because minimizing this guy over x by itself is hard, but doing the ADMM subproblems where you minimize just with respect to x and just with respect to z is easy. Okay? And so if you do go through the same mechanism that we talked about uh, a moment ago, you get the subproblems look like this. Um, Notice that if you look at this subproblem here, if the h is like a psi, if the h is a regularizer, then this problem is actually exactly the Moreau proxim uh, proximity uh, computation, okay? Where this is a psi, this is a least, uh, least uh, squares norm calculation. So in other words, if you've got a problem where you've got f plus a regularizer of some function of x, this step of ADMM is essentially the prox computation. So this looks a lot like these prox gradient methods that I was showing you earlier. In fact, ADMM is very much related to those methods, okay? You can derive, you know, they're all such simple methods that they're all related at some level. So a couple of examples where people, yeah, there's some convergence theory for that. I just want to point out, actually Mario came up with this graph, that the, the, the sort of one of the foundational papers in ADMM was actually from John Eckstein's thesis. I think he wrote the thesis in 89. He sent me a copy way back then. It was sitting on my shelf for a long time. I still have the PDF. Um, and then they wrote a paper that appeared in 1992. And the paper just sat there. This is Google Scholar for that paper, the citation history. It just sat there until 2007. You know, it wasn't forgotten. People were citing it like 10 or 20 times a year. But then suddenly it was rediscovered in 2008. And the citation kind of had this, has this sudden burst of activity. This is only partial. 2013 will end up here somewhere, right? So, um, so it's be become a very popular uh, paper. So in the special case of, it doesn't matter if I missed the last section, all right? So the special case of L2, L1, which we've been talking about a lot, if you apply ADMM to that, as I told you a moment ago, the, the minimization over Z just becomes this prox computation, the soft thresholding computation. The minimization over X is actually a hard problem. Minimization over x is like solving a regularized least squares problem. And so there are codes that do this, but they do this approximately. Okay, they just get an approximate minimization here. So there's this code YAL1, which basically does that first step approximately. Um, I just wanted to mention how you would do this for inverse covariance. So I wrote down this formulation of sparse inverse covariance recovery earlier. We had log dead here, you had the inner product, you plug in the sample covariance matrix, you have a regularizer here. Now if I do ADMM on this, I'm going to replace the second x here with a z, okay? And I'm going to introduce a constraint x equals z. So this problem is exactly equivalent to this. But I'm now going to do sparse inverse 
uh, I'm going to do ADMM on this. So here's the step of regularizing over X. So it's basically a sort of a regularized form where the one norm has gone here and we've replaced it by a nice smooth quadratic. And then the intermediate step here is like a shrink applied to the component wise L1 norm. So you can do this step very efficiently. And then you can update U, which is the approximate multipliers, again using this nice linear formula. So ADMM applied to this problem is a reasonably efficient way to go about it. And there are some papers on that. And there's some more details about how you do that intermediate step. It's actually a little bit intricate. You have to do some decompositions. And you have to do fancy stuff with solving quadratics and so on. But the framework is all, uh, is all nice. OK, and this is the last part, which I've got all of three minutes to talk about. But I've heard the words coordinate descent or coordinate ascent or block coordinate ascent came across a lot in Zuban's talk. And it's being used in a lot of other contexts. And I just wanted to say uh, in the three minutes that are remaining, maybe I can just hit on the ideas of what's going on here. So the fundamental coordinate descent method is where you've got a, you know, the same sort of function we've been dealing with. But the way that you work is you just pick a single index of x, right? And you just take a step just in that component, OK? The block generalization, of course, is where you choose a block of indices and take a step in that block, fix all the others, right? That's the basic idea. If you've got regularizers and constraints, they, they mess you up a little bit. Uh, it's not so bad if the regularizers break down along the same lines as the blocks, right? Or the con if the constraints are bounds, they're easy to deal with. But if you've got constraints that couple different components or different blocks, then this all becomes a bit harder. Now, this method has a long history in SVM. So one of the first things that people did with a dual form of SVM which is this problem here, where this is the kernel, and these are sort of the multipliers for the support vectors. Uh, there are a whole bunch of attempts to do a block coordinate descent on this problem. And they have the advantage that each step of block coordinate descent is pretty cheap, because you only, you only need a couple of components of the gradient. And so uh, you know that's cheap to calculate, much cheaper than computing the whole gradient. So SMO, which I think dates back to 1997, picks two components to update. Uh, there are other approaches that choose more than two components or 400 components or whatever, but they all have this form, okay? Now, what about the analysis of these methods? There was some analysis of these in two minutes left. There was some analysis of these, I know, in, um, in the SVM context, but more generally, uh, what does the analysis look like? Well, it turns out that it depends how you choose the order of components to update. There are some people that do like a cyclic order, I heard Zuban mention that in his talk this morning, I think. Um, so there are deterministic type update uh, strategies. And then there are stochastic update strategies. And I think I meant, I'm sorry, I'm skipping all over here. I know it drives you crazy. Um, it turns out that the stochastic strategy, where, where you just pick an index at random, these are actually easy to analyze. It's easier to do convergence analysis of these methods. So. One of the first papers in convergence that I know about is this fundamental paper of Lo and Seng from 20 years ago. They did analyze a deterministic strategy. I don't think they proved a convergence rate, but they proved, a, um, they proved some sort of uh, overall convergence. The stochastic analysis is much more recent, and people have done that. Uh, Nesterov has a paper that's very recent. So I guess I'll end up by saying that we have worked on um, stochastic versions of this method that can be implemented asynchronously. So you might remember earlier today I told you about Hogwild, which was asynchronous stochastic gradient. We've got a Hogwild-like strategy for stochastic coordinate descent, where each of the processes that you've got will pick at random a coordinate, will take a coordinate descent, will update x, and they'll do this in a completely asynchronous, uncoordinated fashion. And we're able to show that for a suitable choice of step length, um, you get the same sort of linear uh, convergence that you see for the serial method, provided you don't run it on too many processes, right? There's some bound on how many processes you can run this on. So that's the theme of what I had in the last part of the talk. And we've got an implementation where we show that for some pretty simple random problem with 20,000 variables, we've got a U-Butte uh, 40 core Intel machine, and we ran it on different numbers of processes and got speed ups of up to, I don't know, 26 or something. And we saw no degradation in the number of passes that we had to do over the data. So jumping to the conclusions and finishing, I've got 20 seconds left. Okay, so summarizing the last four and a half hours of discussion, um, 
what I hope we've, we've done is we've gone over a sample of optimization tools, most of which I think are relevant to learning as currently practiced. And some of them, like uh, interior point methods, I think are going to be relevant in future, but maybe at the moment it's kind of tenuous. But, but, uh, and there are probably some other tools lurking out there, like ADMM was lurking out there for many years. There are probably some other tools that may be relevant in, uh, in the future. So I haven't certainly covered, haven't covered everything, but if you go back to those matching slides that I put up right at the start from my SIG KDD talk, where I had three slides of matching tools to applications, there's some more, uh, possibly some more leads in there you can look at. I should mention that as, apart from being a source of algorithmic tools, I think optimization has something to offer in figuring out the best way to formulate problems, okay? Not just in algorithms. And I should point out that one healthy thing about the optimization community is that our community really likes it when we collaborate on people from other areas with really nice, sexy problems. We really get brownie points for that, right? And other people are not like that. I know other communities are not like that. So this is a good positive thing about our community. So we like talking to people with really good problems, right? So don't hesitate to bother your local optimizer or bother me or, <laughs> or other people that you would like to talk to. Okay, so we're done. I've got pages and pages of references here. So I hope you're recording all this. 11 pages of references. Um, but you can get a copy of the deck if you want to check those out. So thank you, and it's time for questions. Thanks. All right. Do we have any questions? Everyone's exhausted. Mm, we're staring at you. There's one. Uh, okay. So I'm, I'm doing meta, but I'm not a fan of meta, but I think it's very practical to use. So uh, what was your optimization toolbox? Is it something one should try to avoid? And better <laughs> Okay, can we turn off the cameras here? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, no, it doesn't have a very uh, good reputation, I would say. So there's L, uh, L, what, LP solve or LP prog or something and Q quad prog. Um, and then there are some uh, nonlinear searches. So, um, I mean, it's a natural thing to try if you've paid the $100 or whatever for the toolbox. Um, uh, you certainly should try it. Um, but, uh, you know, if it breaks down, uh, don't blame the algorithm necessarily. Blame the software first and maybe try, try some other uh, toolboxes before you completely give up on optimization, right, as a field. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions from the voices above? Observation launch? There are no questions. There are no questions. There are no questions. Ah. Ah. Who, who said that? Who? Uh, on that which mailing list was this machine? Oh yeah, I've heard about that. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I I didn't see any harm in doing it yourself. I mean, given that we've got this MATLAB, which is this very powerful, high-level language, um, you know, why not try things yourself? Um, particularly if you don't have access to libraries. I mean, you get some understanding for how they're working, right, if you do it yourself. And some of these recent algorithms, like these um, prox gradient algorithms for compressed sensing, we've implemented them completely in MATLAB. And the codes are quite short, you know, sparse you can download and GPSR. And they're very short. And if you look at them for, a, you know, an hour or two, you can figure out basically everything that's going on in there. So, um, you know, it really depends what your goals are. If you just want to prototype an algorithm quickly, you know, why not implement it yourself? Um, but if you're looking for a highly efficient solution, certainly you shouldn't leave the, the stones unturned of using libraries and using more powerful applications. Um, there are some cases, I have this code from, uh, with Mike Gertz from called OOQP, from, uh, wait, wait, who laughed? 
<laughs> All right, so there's a code from 2000 uh, where we sort of wrote it as an object-oriented C++ code and we structured it so that um, you could plug in, you could write special solvers for the linear algebra that were customized to the structure or your application. So the code implements the whole interior point framework with you know, clever choices for doing the perturbation and doing the step length and so on, but it allows you to customize it to your application. So that was one attempt at using object-oriented programming that sort of tried to give you the benefits of having a rigorous, robust library implementation and at the same time being able to customize it. So that is kind of a, you know, something that's midway between your own implementation and a, just a package implementation. Ah, yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't talk much about those, unfortunately. I didn't have a lot of time. But generally, these algorithms are, um, you know, in non convex optimization, the sort of convergence re result you get is typically just convergence to a stationary point. That's where the gradient is zero. Or maybe to a local minimizer. If you've got a trust region method, you can prove convergence to a local minimizer. But converging to global minimizers is very, very hard. In general, that's just a really hard problem. Um, often if you know a lot about your function, if you've got additional information about your function, like you've got a uniform upper bound on the uh, norm of the Hessian or something like that, uh, you can devise methods that will search for global optimum fairly um, efficiently, right? So if you know that the function is not varying incredibly much over a short distance, then you can do some sort of branch and bound approach where you can break the space up into regions and sort of search each region thoroughly and make sure that you haven't missed some important minimizer. Or you can do the simple thing of, you know, just starting from a bunch of random points and looking at what they converge to. But, you know, generally it's just a hard problem. And people in deep learning are having to confront this problem because deep learning models are extremely non-convex. And my impression is that, uh, you know, basically people are sort of punting on that problem. They're just kind of running the stochastic gradient for a certain amount of time and it's probably not even getting anywhere close to a local solution, but it's an improvement on where they started. So, you know, it does a reasonable job of classification. So, so it's just a hard problem. And, you know, if you do make any progress on it, you have to really take the uh, account of the, whatever structure there is in the function, I would say. 